biggest thing is we just want to teach people to live life despite their symptoms. We don't want to live life in spite of those things because that's what's going to make us go more into anxiety and depression and all of that. We really hope to empower people, give them that independence, decrease the anxiety about their symptoms, educate them, and just really give them the tools to live a successful, happy life. Well said. Welcome to The Uptick. Brought to you by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, empowering children and adults through education, advocacy, and research by sharing the stories and experiences relevant to the TS community. Welcome to this episode of The Uptick. I'm here today with Shannon Floyd and Jan Rowe, both occupational therapists with an interest in Tourette Syndrome. And I want to start by kicking things off with a discussion broadly about OT and, and what it is and how it can help people with Tourette syndrome. Would you each like to share a little bit about that and the work that you do with Tourette patients? Sure. Hi, Michael. Thank you for having us. This is a great opportunity for Shannon and I to talk about OT in the world of tick disorders and Tourette. I think before 2010, most occupational therapists would have said that they used a sensory approach when working with people who had tics and Tourette. And certainly there was nothing wrong with that. It just didn't work very well. And it was very slow progress, I would say at best, if, if there was any progress at all. But what we know now is that CBIT obviously is the frontline defense for, uh, in terms of treatment for people with tics and Tourette, if they want to learn how to manage their tics and, and the coexisting conditions that often go with that. And so occupational therapists are now being trained in CBIT, which is an excellent fit for us as occupational therapists because it's just so in our wheelhouse and in terms of the contextual elements that go along with treating people with tics and Tourette, teaching people how to become aware of triggers, those settings where either they tick less and noticing that and trying to replicate that, or in those settings where they're ticking more or maybe their anxiety is greater, which then, of course, triggers their tics. So, you know, OTs are, are a great discipline to look at in terms of someone to help work with you, either regarding the tics themselves or the comorbid conditions that often go with it. And I think the special thing that OTs bring to the table is we look at activities of daily living, right? Just occupational therapists were trained for that. And so in the tick disorder, Tourette syndrome world, what we're looking at is how do your current symptoms impact your ability to be independent? A big one that we look at is sleep hygiene, because we know, like Jan said, the triggers that impact these tick symptoms, we're trying to not only address the ticks, but figure out what is it that's making them worse. And so that would be understanding things like, like what's causing those premonitory urges? Like when I have a bout of ticks, you know, am I frustrated? I'm stressed. My muscles often tense. I, my posture gets worse before I tick. Is it a part of it understanding those sorts of symptoms that happen before the tick? That's more of, of in the CBIT realm, but with the OT realm, we're just trying to see, is it a certain teacher for a young kid? Is it a certain teacher at school? Is it a certain time of the day? especially in adulthood, caffeine. We all like our coffee in the morning. And I've seen people who are like, when I have caffeine or it, more than two cups of caffeine, my tick symptoms get worse. It can be environmentally triggered. It definitely can be triggered by that anxiety and um, some of those underlying conditions as well. And then when you bridge over into CBIT, which is Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks, that's where OTs really do well with the body awareness and motor planning. And what are you feeling prior to a tick occurring? And then training them kind of how to manage that a little better. I see. And you can work with both children and adults with ticks, right? Absolutely. Even kids as young as five. I know Jan has talked wow. about that. Yes. People with tick disorder and Tourette syndrome, their interoceptive awareness, their internal awareness is heightened. It's, I always say it's almost like there's a spotlight internally and they're hyper aware sometimes of things going on, but sometimes they feel those things so much every day that they just are used to it. So then when we go to try to train them for dealing with different ticks, they're not associating, oh, that's the urge I feel prior to this tick. So we have to weed some of that out for them. I imagine it's incredibly empowering to develop that skill set at such a young age, five years old, and you're already learning about the premonitory urges before your ticks and emotional regulation, which we'll talk about next. I mean, I, to teach young children about emotional intelligence, you're preparing them for a life of being 
able to to do I mean, so many different things because they master that at such a young age. I think that's incredible. We have kids that when they come in to see us, they're so down on themselves about their tics. They feel like they're the only person in the world that has tics. They don't know anybody else that has tics. They're oftentimes making decisions to opt out of activities. I don't want to play baseball anymore. I don't want to go to this place anymore. And then they learn some of these tools from CBIT. I imagine that does wonders for self-esteem and, and socializing and, and just, yeah, the, the self-empowerment there. I want to hear a little bit more about both of your backgrounds and what got you interested in this. I can start by saying Jan is the reason <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing what I'm doing. Just a quick story. I was working in Louisiana at the time as an occupational therapist in a private outpatient sensory-based setting. Like she said, we tried using sensory strategies. Had a kiddo come in with significant tics that took him out of school, took him out of all of his activities. And I knew nothing about CBIT at that time. Looked on the Tourette Association of America's website, found Dr. Brown, reached out to her personally. I'm like, I need you to help me. This kid had said, I'm going to conquer this. I don't know how. And he said, well, I'm going to help you. And I don't know how, but we're going to figure it out. That's how it started for me. And Dr. Rao was amazing. We did a little session together in what, three sessions, Jan? We were able to get that kid. He had such a loud vocal tick that everybody could hear him coming from like a mile away. And by session three, everyone was like, wow, is he here? Is he actually in the building? It made a significant impact. And right there, I was hooked because I've always been an OT who does sensory processing, but this just the effects. I mean, it just took hold so much quicker. So that's my journey into where I am now. But yeah, it's all because of Jan. <laughs> well, thank you, Jan. Uh, that's wonderful. And I thank Shannon for sharing that. I appreciate it. Jan, I'd love to hear your, your story. Yeah. So I worked, uh, I still work with a movement disorders neurologist here at Children's of Alabama. I worked with him in his adult clinic for Huntington's disorder for, I don't know, two decades. It was kind of comical because everybody that worked in the adult clinic, we were all pediatric therapists, including him as a pediatric neurologist. But just through some bureaucracy, that clinic got moved to adult side of, of sort of the health center. And so we didn't have a clinic to work with anymore. And about six months after that happened, he called me one day and said, hey, the Tourette Association has this, this group looking at this new behavioral therapy for kids and adults with tics and Tourette. I've probably got 200 kids on my caseload with ticks. Why don't you get certified and we'll start a clinic? And that was in like late 2009. We had the Tourette Association come down and train us. It was actually the first time they trained OTs. And I was one of two OTs that got trained in that session. We started our clinic three months later, January of uh, 2010 at UAB, the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And we've been going strong ever since. So I was actually the first OT to start a CBIT clinic that was developed and, and implemented by an occupational therapist and have since been involved in the training of other OTs, have just recently submitted the OT CBIT manual to the Tourette Association for publication. I myself have Tourette. My mother has Tourette. My grandmother had Tourette. My mom was one of six kids and three of her siblings had or have Tourette. It's funny because none of that really entered into my brain until I was probably three years in. I mean, I immediately started using competing responses for my own tics that were, you know, still noticeable, especially when I would get excited or stressed or presenting or that kind of thing. But it was really not until about three years in that I really realized the magnitude of Tourette history in my own family. And then on my dad's side, just like OCD to the max. And I myself have OCD as well. So it's kind of come full circle for me. Oh, that's that's incredible to hear. Thank you for sharing that. A lot of our listeners are, are adults with TS or allies to the community. And I can so clearly see the benefit of OT for children. I can also see it for adults. But I w I'm wondering if for, for our listeners' sake, if we can talk a little bit about like Sell OT for an adult with Tourette. Why should they go and see you? How can you make their life better? That's what I would love to hear. It doesn't matter how old you are. If So I, the term occupational therapy, occupational is a little misleading. And I think as a profession, we haven't always done a great job in terms of explaining. But occupations are basically anything you do in your day that have meaning and purpose to you. So whether that's work or playing your guitar or taking care of your children or being the best at your job or, you know, being the best student that you can be, it doesn't matter what it is that you do as your occupation. 
If there's something in your life that's getting in the way of your performance and your engagement in that occupation, then you need an occupational therapist. That's kind of cut to the chase right there. So if it's ticks, for instance, that are impairing your ability to engage in, in the various occupations that you find just to be uh, important in your life and that you're passionate about, then an occupational therapist could help you with that. A lot of people who have ticks and Tourette have difficulty with executive functioning skills. They have difficulty with sensory processing. So all of the things that are kind of in an OT's wheelhouse are still beneficial to you, whether you're an adult or a child, married, single, doesn't matter anything about your status. If, if there are things getting in the way of you doing what you want to do and being able to do it to the best of your ability, then an OT could be helpful to you. Well put. Shannon, any thoughts you'd add on to that? I was like, Jan got it all. That was great. <laughs> that was very thorough. Yeah. She's right. I mean, it really does. It's just, it impacts you differently throughout life and maybe for a later time. But as you get older, driving or holding a job and we train people on accommodations and rights that they can access as well, because sometimes there is a little discrimination in the workplace. We really bring them to that Threat Association of America and we're like, okay, here's the resources, here's the support and get them plugged in that way too. And then a child, you're talking about the educational rights and all of this for people with ticks and Tret in the school system. And Jan and I got lots of stories to share about that kind of stuff. But we really are a great advocate as well. So not only being the occupational therapist and a little bit of figuring out there's a tick iceberg that a lot of people will see when they first come to see it or see a neurologist. It just shows that ticks are the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot of underlying conditions that can impact tick symptoms. And so sometimes we're the person, the first person, who's been able to take a look at all of those and say, okay, your ticks aren't the biggest factor right now. Your mm -hmm. OCD or your anxiety mm -hmm. are things that need to be addressed first. So we're just looking at that iceberg saying, what's the most impactful symptom on your ability to engage in these activities of daily living? It makes so much sense. Prioritize our stressors. And that changes, like you've alluded to, it changes through life. I mean, my OCD went into remission at some point in high school. ADHD has impacted me in different ways, depending on the job and my manager and the work I'm doing. I find like different ways it impacts me. Ticks still wax and wane even as an adult. So it, it, it is a constant a, a adjustment and evolution that we're adapting to. I would love to dive into the iceberg idea, the, the model. I think all of our listeners are familiar with that. The sensory piece specifically, growing up, I had some of this. I, I grew up in a family of four. There were four of us kids. Three of us have a, a TS diagnosis, but we're like the perfect kind of Punnett Square Tourette family because we each have different co-occurring conditions. And like, I'm more ticks. My, the two siblings are, are more the co-occurring and, and their ticks are more mild than mine. But my brother and I both had a lot of sensory issues. Neither of us wore jeans until... Wow, at least until high school, we just didn't like the fabric. We didn't like the feeling of it. My brother did not drink soda. The carbonation just bothered his throat. There were a number of things like this. And no, I don't think they got to the point that they were preventing us from engaging or enjoying major life experiences. The wearing jeans thing, I mean, every American wears jeans. Like, so that was kind of like something by high school. I kind of made myself do that and, and eventually got used to it. Now I, I'm fine with them. But I would love to hear how you work with the sensory piece, especially, and how you help folks bring more comfort around some of this. Yeah, that's been my career focus pretty much the entire time I've been at OT. And it's interesting how it's changed as I work with the tick and trap world. So initially, I would just work with sensory processing issues. And so I would work a lot on sensory diet and mostly in kids. You know, what are they craving? How can we give them? the input they're creating so they can feel more regulated. And it's interesting as I dive into the, the tick and trap world and those processing issues, it's almost like everybody's almost hyper responsive to everything. And so I find myself more coming up with accommodations, adaptations to things. You, know, you talked about clothing. There's different clothing lines like Smart Knit and those types of things that make clothing designed for people with sensory processing issues that don't like tags in their clothing or the way that socks feel on their feet. Yeah, I have that. Yeah, you got that, right? <laughs> Another one is that misophonia piece of this. There's a lot of hypersensitivity to auditory input. And so, especially in the adolescent world, they're very social, wanting to go to concerts and movie theaters and all the things. And just the noise level can be really insulting to their nervous system. And so 
We talk a lot on noise canceling earbuds and things like that. And then teaching them to adapt. So maybe put both of those noise canceling earbuds in your ear as you're walking into the venue to prepare yourself. Then we teach coping and self-regulation strategies when you're there to calm your nervous system down. As you feel more comfortable in that space, maybe take one of those earbuds out. We're really good at what we call chaining. We want to get you to where you can go and not have to use these adaptations, but we got to progressively get you there. Can we actually get allow ourselves to get sidetracked a little bit? I, I would love to talk about functional ticks with you because that has been an issue that's coming up, especially in, during the pandemic and then social media. I, we've seen this massive rise in especially teenage girls that, that are presenting with these tick-like symptoms. It's so big. We don't know exactly what all is going on. Some could be real Tourette cases. Others could be another tick disorder. It could be a number of things going on. How do these patients, and, and I, I don't want to generalize, but but the patients that come forward with, with functional tics and, and that kind of symptom, how does the work you do with them differ from someone with like a pure Tourette's kind of diagnosis? That's a great question. And I think when we first started seeing the real upswing in functional tics early in the pandemic time, there were a lot of us that were reaching out to the threat world is kind of small, even, you know, across all of the, the country borders. It's a small world of specialists. And so we were all sort of reaching out to each other. And it's not like functional disorders were new, but this manifestation of functional tics and the um, propensity in which we were seeing these functional tics was definitely new. And so I think in the beginning, I would say probably the first three months, I don't know that we, in my institution, I don't know that we did such a great job to begin with because it was a big learning curve. The numbers were incredibly huge. Just to give you an example, I mean, prior to COVID and the pandemic, I would maybe see one or two functional kids in a year. And during that time, I was seeing upwards of 10 to 12 new kids in a week. That was the new ones a week, in addition to kids that were coming back on a weekly basis. So, I mean, the population, it just absolutely exploded. I think within a, the first couple of months, we got pretty good at saying, okay, we're going to kind of have an approach to this. And so the first thing that we need to do is make sure that people have the right name for what's happening. Because they were coming in oftentimes with diagnosis of Tourette. Mostly pediatricians were actually diagnosing them with Tourette and then sending them to see that. So we were trying to explain to them that I'm not a physician. I can't diagnose. However, I can tell you that what I'm seeing and that if I had one of my neurologists here with, with us, they would likely tell you that this is not Tourette. This is not organic tics. You know, this falls under that umbrella of functional tics. And so we started basically zooming in one of our neurologists with each new consult because I wanted them to hear from a neurologist the diagnosis, the actual diagnosis, and then we did some education with that. And then we basically said three things. We think we can help you by doing CBIT, although CBIT's, that's not what this CBIT's designed for, but it, we have seen some good success. But you've got to agree to a couple of things. You've got to agree to see a therapist to work on the underlying you know, condition of anxiety, trauma, grief, whatever this is. You've got to stay off of social media platforms and following people with ticks and Tourette. And you have to show up for these sessions. And if you're willing to do those things, then I'd love to like get you started in CBIT and see how much we can help. And once we took that approach by naming it what it was and doing the education, having them buy in with almost like a verbal contract, and then using CBIT, we started seeing great results. I have heard that the prognosis for functional tics is great, that like you can use therapy and kind of more or less get rid of it in most cases, like make it go away. Exactly. And that's another reason I think people kind of distinguish it from like the pure Tourette, organic Tourette is because like it's like more or less curable or, or, or a lot more treatable. And it sounds like that's something you've seen as well. Interesting stuff. I might actually bring you guys back on to do a deeper dive into that. I've been looking for some people that can speak to the functional tick side, just because that is very new. And it's kind of, yeah, like you said, being talked about in the Tourette world now. Getting back to our topic, though, and I do appreciate you entertaining that kind of aside. Would love to dive into the emotional regulation piece. I find as an adult, I mean, now I, I run my own career coaching business. But when I was going into the office every day, emotional regulation was something I think I could have benefited from working with some kind of therapist on, and not that like there were big issues, but just I stifled a lot of the challenges that I was going through. 
working with a manager that I, I maybe we didn't get along well, or I go I, bouncing from one task to another has always been difficult. And that can be some of maybe my ADHD as well, making that transition. Talk a little bit about, if you can, about how you help clients with emotional regulation in, in your clinical practice. I loved how you, you said that I stifled things down, right? That was like, that's a perfect segue into what we were going to talk about. We talk about a frustration beaker. We all have one. What fills yours? And so we do a really good job at like really diving in. And like you said, is it a certain person at work? Is it the climate in your office? Sometimes, right? We respond to hot, cold temperatures, that sensory piece of things too. But what are those things that are frustrating you throughout the day? And just having ticks in general, you already wake up and your beaker's already a little bit full because if there's OCD that goes along with that, maybe getting out of bed, you have to do that a certain way and you have a ritual before you leave. And if it doesn't go the right way, you have to redo it. So now that's setting you behind and you're getting to work late. And it's like, what are these factors that are impacting you all together? But we take a look at what's going on. What is your frustration beaker? What's filling it? And then we really take a look at what are those early warning signs that are telling you that you're about to get overwhelmed? We're not always keen on that. We don't understand it all the time. We just kind of go from zero to a hundred. All of a sudden we've got all these things happening. And so we really work on that body awareness, introceptive awareness. What is my body doing when it's getting increasingly frustrated or stressed out? And then we use self-regulation and coping skills to kind of help bring that down. I know I use a a stress thermometer a lot for all ages and we all need it. And so it's like, when you have a small amount of stress, what does that look like? When you have a moderate amount of stress, I always knew when I was young that my mom was really frustrated because you would hear the cabinets start closing a little bit harder, right? Yeah. Or like that. And so I always bring <laughs> parents into it, especially with kids. We all have a beaker. What does it look like for you? And then we start to identify, you know what? Before lunch, your beaker's getting really full because we see these body signs. Maybe it's because you're hungry. Maybe it's because you're getting fatigued. Let's incorporate a protein-based snack. You know, so it helps us figure out what those triggers are even more. And if we can address those, it helps with that overall ability to self-regulate. And a lot of times in school or workplace, people are suppressing tick symptoms. And one thing we know about ticks, that's like that volcano experiment, right? The baking soda and vinegar, you suppress all day long and you get home and it is just like an overflow of tick symptoms. So how can we help you better manage throughout your day so you don't come home and have those big explosions? And Shannon, you've hit on all of the pieces of it. And I think one of the biggest deterrents to that is people just being willing to recognize, just be aware of themselves and admit that, yeah, I'm frustrated or yeah, I'm feeling overwhelmed or yes, I'm hangry. Give me that Snickers bar, whatever it is. I mean, I'm 64 years old. My partner will look at me and say, I can tell in your eyes that you're hungry. And I know you're going to tell me you're not hungry. You don't feel like you need to eat, but I'm telling you right now, go get something. And sure enough, if I could just stop myself for two seconds then I realized, yeah, she's right. I'll get something to eat and take a few seconds to just breathe or walk outside, stand on the porch, whatever, play with a dog and things are better. So I think admitting to ourselves that we do have that beaker that is about to explode, really paying attention to those warning signs because these things don't usually happen without it. And it may not be obvious. So sometimes it's like putting puzzle pieces together that are laser cut pieces and they're hard to discern. But you can usually find some kind of warning signal that's happening. Then you act by what is it that I can do that unloads my beaker a bit, that gives me a little room from the top so I'm not quite as near to the top and and ready to spill over. And sometimes that's just as simple as taking a break, taking 15 seconds even. It doesn't have to be, when you say breaks to adults, they oftentimes are like, I don't have time for a break. You have 15 seconds. You can breathe. You can look in another direction. You can walk to the end of the hallway. You can get out of your cubicle. I am such a news junkie. And right now in this world that we live in, I mean, there's so much going on on a daily basis. It's like, I have to know, but at some point I also have to tell myself enough because I know that a lot of my body and mental stress and, and response is simply because what's going on in this world. There's just so much chaos. There's so much hatred and visceral response from people. And at some point you have to just allow yourself to unplug. 
and to take that 15 seconds. I think that's relatable to a lot of people that that work in an office setting or where they couldn't just go leave for the afternoon. I found pressure. I'd go for a walk and being in Mm -hmm. a city like New York was nice because it is so walkable. I could just go for a 15 minute walk and come back or take a longer bathroom break, restroom break, get some water, stuff like that. Talk to me a little bit about why someone might want to see an OT as opposed to an LCSW, like a social worker. I think because of all those factors that we talked about, we're not just looking at the mental health components. We are looking at underneath that iceberg. And I think they're really good at helping in different ways, but I think we all benefit the patient in different ways. And that's also a timing piece. It's just like the iceberg. It's looking at what do you need now? And then what therapist is going to help you achieve what you need now? You may need a multitude of things, but right now it seems like the sensory issues are the biggest or the executive functioning issues are the biggest problem for you. So I think it, it does take that team, but we, and, and oftentimes we all are working together. And then other times it's a matter of, let me see you for six or seven sessions and then go to so-and-so. Or maybe you've done a year with a psychologist and now you're coming for kind of about with OT to help with some of these other issues. So part of it is diagnostically driven. And the other part is just in terms of, you know, timing and what your priorities are and and what's causing you issues. I want to transition into a discussion around how our listeners can find people like you and and work with you, especially if they live in rural communities, they're not in the South. Can your work be done remotely? Yes, that's all I do. I do tell a CBIT. And it is very nice for people in rural areas. I'm in the state of Tennessee. And there's a lot of people who will drive into Nashville, go to Vanderbilt. They've got some amazing neurologists there. And there's a limited number of OT and mental health professionals that are certified in CBIT. So it's not always that they can find a provider that they can drive to. So I think during COVID, I was kind of doing tele-CBIT prior to that. But during COVID, we all really learned what a benefit it could be. And it's just as effective as the in-person sessions. What I love about it, I actually will have people, okay, take me to the grocery store. Let's work on tick management while you're getting groceries and things like that. So I love it because I'm a little portable where I I couldn't be everywhere at every time, but it gives me some of that flexibility too. I love that actually, the idea of it's more immersive. You can actually see me in the situations where I would need this. And otherwise I'm in my session hours later with you. And I'm trying to remember how I was feeling at the grocery store hours ago, days ago. You can actually treat me in the moment, which is wonderful. During the pandemic, all of the restrictions and the the licensure piece got relaxed across the states. So we were all able to see people across state lines via telehealth, which was awesome. And we were hoping that would be the one thing that stuck post-COVID. It didn't. And so now we're back to, for a lot of insurances, there are still some that will pay for it. But the good news, I think, is that through the American OT Association and our National Board of Certification, There's a thing called OT Compact. It starts next year in 2024, and it's actually an agreement state by state with the National Board of OTs that will allow occupational therapists that have from states that have signed on to compact agreement to see people across state lines. So, for instance, if you're in Virginia and I'm in Alabama and both states have signed the OT Compact agreement, then I can see you. I can be your treating therapist in Virginia. I want to say it's 36 states now have actually signed the agreement. And so this is becoming a a real doable kind of thing for people. The other thing to note for your listeners as adults, if they have children up to the age of 21, a third of the OT workforce is actually based in school systems. And so for their children, if they are having issues or they have tics, OCD, or, or some of those comorbid conditions themselves, their children can actually be served in schools from three years to 21 years by occupational therapists. And then outside of the school setting, obviously, they can find us on the Tourette Association website. They can also just Google occupational therapists in their area, and then they'll get a pretty good list just from Google in terms of who has private practices, who's associated with certain maybe outpatient hospitals, that kind of thing. And it's a bit more work just making cold calls, but yeah, obviously, the more specific they get in the Google search, the, the, the better fit they'll find in terms of an OT. I, I love that you brought up the OT Compact Agreement. And, and for our listeners, you can read more about this at otcompact.org slash about. 
One of the things that's come up a few times in this session is around building a sort of team around the patient. It could be an MD, it could be an, o, an OT on the team, you've got maybe a social worker, psychologist. If someone is working through telehealth with, with an OT, what advice do you have for those patients to build that team and, and get that maybe a little bit of collaboration between the professionals that are working with them, especially, and I always bring up the folks in rural areas because I, I grew up in Indiana and this was a challenge for my family. How can we make that work? What are the best practices for the patient to take that initiative and, and build that team? I will say that's something that OTs just kind of naturally do. <laughs> we really do. I have an amazing team here in Nashville. Dr. Isaacs and his team at Vanderbilt are wonderful. They have a TRET clinic there. He actually holds once a month meetings for professionals who work with people with sleep disorder and TRET syndrome, and we just collaborate and share ideas. So anytime I have a patient with ticks and it's referred from a certain neurologist, I'm always sending them the report and communicating with them because that is so important to have both people on board. Because if they're getting told by the neurologist is something different than what we as OT see, then it just, it the progress isn't, is it's just not going to work as well. And so I do think we do that pretty naturally, especially with mental health professionals. I want them to know what we worked on, where we've left off and kind of what my concerns are. Because like you said, when you leave a session, two days down the road, three days down the road, you're, wait, what was it? Why does she want me to go see that provider? I always have them sign a release so that I can speak with the mental health provider. And then I can just express things we were working on that I found it difficult or that they found it difficult to manage. And so that it just gives a clear picture for that therapist as well. And the patients really appreciate that because they're trying to communicate with so many people. They forget, they leave those meetings like, oh, I should have asked this question. We can be that middleman and go, okay, let's reach out to your neurologist and see what they say. That or, makes or a whatever. lot of sense. So, yeah. How do patients or, or clients find someone that is an OT and, and has a b background in Tourette syndrome or can do CBIT for Tourette? Because not all OTs can do CBIT. What tips do you have for our listeners that may be trying to find someone like that? The best place is going to be the Tourette Association. You can actually put in their occupational therapist and, and every OT that has been CBIT certified should be on that list. The other thing is if you live in an area where there's a Tourette Center of Excellence, then you can reach out to them. Many of the TS Centers of Excellence now employ OTs as part of their centers for different reasons. Some are doing the CBIT. Every center is a little bit different, but it's kind of a good place to start if you're not finding that person on the Tourette Association webpage. NJCTS can also make referrals to physicians, therapists, and other specialists. Anyone interested can call or email the NJCTS office and request a referral. I'm going to have to bring you guys back on. There's just so much we could discuss. I think our biggest thing is we just want to teach people to live life despite their symptom. We don't want to live life in spite of those things because that's what's going to make us go more into anxiety and depression and all of that. We really hope to empower people, give them that independence, decrease the anxiety about their symptoms, educate them, and just really give them the tools to live a successful, happy life. Well said. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. This has been it. We've, we've covered so much and I still only scratch the surface. Each of these could be dived into <laughs> so much deeper. So thank you both for your time. I'm so grateful to have you on The Uptick. Thank you, Michael. It's been fun. Thank you for having us. And this has been The Uptick brought to you by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome. Join us in two weeks for the next episode. Thank you for listening to The Uptick brought to you by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, empowering you to stretch the boundaries to live your best life. The NJ Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, NJCTS, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on this podcast. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any guest, nor do we advocate any treatment. <laughs>